Influence Church exists to help you know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and influence your world. Good morning, everyone. You made it to church. Great job. I hope you can prepare for a couple hours. <laughs> now, I'm going to share a few things about those two books. But um, So, welcome to week number four in uh, this series called What the Bible is All About. And... This series actually came out from a survey that we uh, uh, did at Easter, and I'm so proud of all of you guys, because you didn't want to learn about Vikings, you didn't want to learn about the Packers, you didn't even want to learn about Democrats or Republicans, you wanted to learn about the Bible, so actually I'm very, I was very, very touched and proud, because your desire to study and to learn more from the Bible, it's very, very uh, emotional, and also it's expressing that you have a desire to grow in your relation with God, which is that's why we have Influence Church, to inspire people to do just that. Although some of you express some interest in uh, gui some guidance in going to vote on Tuesday and how you should vote. So when we vote in the election, we use our God-given voice, if you want to call it, uh, to vote godly principles. The issues, actually, when we go to vote, the issues that we vote on is not just political. Some issues are moral and spiritual. Um, do you know, according to uh, uh, research, that almost, uh, in the United States are almost 90 million of evangelicals? Do you know that actually, unfortunately, 40 millions of them are not even voting? Do you know that actually 15 millions of those 90 millions are not even registered to vote? God gave each one of us a voice, and through election price, process, we should we use that voice. So, you might ask, yeah, but how should I vote? And you might ask yourself, and today I want to just make it as clear as I can. As Christians, as believers, we must, we must vote our values. We must vote biblical principles. So, when you are going to go to vote on Tuesday, vote pro-Bible, pro-family, pro-life, pro-Israel. Those are biblical principles that you can find in the Bible. Those are biblical principles that our God stands for. And we should stand for also. So um, on Tuesday, go out and vote. Don't lean left. Don't lean right. Just look up and allow God to speak to you and vote as he will like you to vote. And by the way, no matter how you are going to vote, I promise we are still going to love you on Wednesday. And by the way, no matter what's going to happen Tuesday night or Wednesday morning, I want all of you to know this. God is still on the throne. God is still going to be on the throne. And no matter what is going to be in front of us, no matter what we are going to face in this country, He is going to empower us, He is going to strengthen us, and He is going to help us go through. When I'm saying that, I'm saying that not just like, yeah, it's easy for you to say it because you are a Christian. I grew up in a communist country. The freedom and the benefits that we have in this country is nothing compared with a socialist or a communist country. And you know what? Through the communist country in Romania, actually, the church grew more and more as the persecution was greater and greater. So, I'm not sure what Tuesday is going to bring, but this I know. God is going to empower each one of us to go further in our relation with you and through our lives. So, that's all about election. Let's get back to our what the Bible is all about, right? So, today we are going to conclude our series about uh, what the Bible is all about. 
and we are gonna uh, kind of, I'm gonna kind of speed quick through the New Testament. Some of you need a title for every message, so the title for the message today is All About Jesus. So, uh, three weeks ago, I shared about the Old Testament in only like 30 some minutes. Uh, then uh, uh, Kelly shared about the four Gospels. I spoke last Sunday about the book of Acts, and now we are kind of zoom in through the rest. But the book, uh, the New Testament, kind of a recap of the New Testament is that it has those four Gospels in the beginning. That actually those four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, are four people's account of the same story. As I said uh, uh, last few Sundays, uh, the Bible is not written in a chronological order, right? Uh, some is, but most, most of it is not in the chronological order. So when you read the uh, Gospel of Matthew and you see Jesus was born and towards the end of the uh, book, uh, Jesus died and Jesus uh, uh, is going to heaven. And the following chapter is not that Jesus is born again. Is that the same story is repeating four times. Four different people give the same story uh, from their perspective. After those four Gospels, we have the book of Acts. Book of Acts is the historical record of the first church. And if you were to insert the rest of the New Testament in the biblical chronological order, will have been inserted probably through the book of Acts. So... If you want, you can get a chronological order. So are those out there that you can read the Bible exactly the chronological order. And if you read the book of Acts, you read probably one or two or three chapters. And then you'll have one of those letters or epistles, one of those uh, um, books inserted right between chapter two and three or four and five or six and seven and so on and on. So. The next 21 books after the book of Acts are what are called, 21 books are called epistles. So epistles means letters, and those are Romans through Jude. So epistles means letter, and apostle is a church planter. So those first church apostles from the 12 disciples, uh, Apostle Paul and others, were considered apostles or church planters. They were planting churches, but not pastoring them. They were raising leaders, disciple, uh, disciple them, set up doctrines, install governments, then go and do it again in a different city, or sometimes even in a different country. So, now, to check on those uh, churches, they wrote 21 letters, 21 of them. And some were written to pastors, some were written to the church. Book of Timothy was written to the pastor Timothy. The book of Ephesians was written to the church in Ephesus, which a city that actually still exists in uh, today's uh, modern-day uh, Turkey. So, the gospel is spreading out in Jerusalem, out of Israel, goes to the Gentiles, which, by the way, Gentiles, when you hear that word, that means non-Jewish, is going into the world, because the gospel is for the whole world. So in those letters, you have encouragement, you have training, you have correction. Actually, Book of Corinthians, in fact, is written by Apostle Paul um, to correct, to address some issues that were in the church of uh, Corinth. The church was doing great, but also they were doing some things wrong. So Apostle Paul was trying to correct them and get them on the right track. 13, 13 some, some people say 14 of those books were written by Apostle Paul. So Apostle Paul actually wrote two-thirds of those letters. Hebrew is considered to be written by Apostle Paul, but we cannot know 100% that uh, was written by him. Most of the other letter, it's saying, like me, Apostle Paul, writing to you, and so on and on. Book of Hebrew, we don't know for 100%. So, then after uh, those, uh, one of the letters is written by the brother of Jesus, James. Not the disciple James, 
James. So this is uh, Jesus' brother. Uh, two of the epistles, two of the letters are written by Peter and three from John. And then you have a little, last little tiny, teeny letters that is actually only one chapter, uh, the book of Jude. So you have four books of the gospel, you have book of Acts, and then you have those 21 letters or epistles. And the last but not the least, it's the book of Revelation in the New Testament that actually it's the prophecy of the last days and eternity. This book stands on itself just because it's a, a revelation that God gave to uh, Apostle John on the um, island of Patmos. So the word revelation is a, apocalypse in the original translation. That's where we get the word Apocalypse, which means actually unveiling, not destruction, as some people assume. Every time you read or see some of the mu movies and you think about apocalypse, you think destruction or, you know, the end of the world. Actually, the book, uh, the word apocalypse means revelation, um, unveiling. So God revealed to Apostle John when he was exiled on an island of uh, Patmos, and God showed him how the end times will look like. It is a hard book to read because you have to imagine now John, a man from the first century, think about 2,000 years ago, a man that uh, probably, not probably, a man that never seen a helicopter or never seen anything man-made fly, right? And now he's seeing a metal box flying, in his mind, probably the, all he could say or describe was just a metal dragon, right? Or imagine uh, John seeing uh, nuclear bombs. All he could come up with was just a ball of fire, right? Because he was in the 20... Much easier for us to describe some of those because we've seen them, but, and we know about it. But for him, it was really hard. And because he had a hard time describing everything, the book is a little hard to understand. You have to be very intentional in studying and understanding this book. Uh, it's much harder than any other book in the Bible. I do encourage you to read the whole Bible, including the Revelation. But I encourage you to start with the New Testament, with the four Gospels, the book of Acts, the uh, epistles, the letters, because that is going to give you a much stronger, better, good foundation of who God is and his heart for each one of us. So, today I want to give you one principle and three practices that will help you to understand the Bible much better if you apply them. The principle that I want all of you to understand is that the Bible is alive. The Bible is not like any other books out there. And you might say, what do you mean it's alive? Jesus said this in John chapter 6, verse 63. And today I'm going to give you a lot of Bible verses, but don't worry. If you don't keep up with the notes, you can watch the message later. So, John 6, 63 is saying, the words I have spoken to you, this is Jesus speaking, they are full of spirit and life. So that means it's alive. The word spirit here actually is with capital S because it's a person speaking to us. It's God speaking to us. When you read, when you read the Bible, actually, to be honest with you, it's going to mess with you. It will make you change your life, but for the better. Let me show you again in Hebrew chapter 4 verse 12. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper, sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desire. With other words, will do surgery on your heart. Will do surgery on your hurts, will do surgery on your mistakes, will do surgery in your marriage. It's like 
a precise scalpel in hands of a great surgeon. Now, John and, you know, the disciple didn't know what a scalpel was or a surgeon was during that time. But sometimes that's how I would like to think about this uh, Bible verse, that double-edged sword is like a very sharp scalpel, and the surgeon is going in a surgery. The, uh, the Word of God separates soul and spirit. Well, the soul is the emotions or your will, and the spirit is actually what connects us to God. So it's trying to take all those human uh, um, emotions and uh, to allow us freely to connect with God. For this reason, he's saying it's separating the soul and the uh, spirit. But sometimes I read the Bible and think, ouch, I think I need more of that fruit in my life because I don't have it. I need more of that faith in me. And you heard me say it a few times through this uh, Bible series. We never change the Bible to fit our lifestyle. We change our lifestyle to fit the Bible. And for this reason, being intentional in allowing the Word of God to change us, it's very, very important. So, for this reason, it's so important to have uh, the right attitude about the Bible. There are so many people out there that they don't have the right attitude about the Bible. And when I'm saying that is that they are trying to pick the Bible apart. They are trying to uh, deconstructing, if you want. We do not have the luxury to decide what is right, what is wrong, uh, uh, and what is not. If you, do, if you do start taking apart the Word of God, will ruin the power that actually the Word of God has. To, uh, to affect us, to influence us, to make us better. So, the Word of God is not there to just like pick and choose. It's not a shelf full of cookies that you have an option to choose which one you want. You have to take the whole shelf, which is, I love it. Right? Why have one when you can have the whole shelf? But, the Bible becomes alive when you receive it, you accept it, and you believe it. Let me say it again. The Bible becomes alive when you receive it, when you accept it, and when you believe it. And let me show it to you in the Bible. First Thessalonians, Apostle Paul is saying this. And we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted, not as a human word, so this is, the writers hold, hold uh, held the pen, but God told them what to write. So for this reason, the word of God is inspired by God. It's the word of God. You accept it not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. So to be able to get all the benefits from the word of God, from the Bible, you have to receive it. You have to accept it, that all, the whole Bible is the Word of God, and then you have to obey it. You have to believe it. So, the main principle that I want you to not forget about is this. The Bible is alive. Let it do its work in you. Now, I want to give you three practical things that if you do, will help you understand better the Bible, will help you have a better life, and will help you become a better person. Because that's what the Bible does. So first, I really encourage you to start your day reading God's Word. Doesn't matter if you have three minutes. Doesn't matter if you have 15 minutes or more. The important part is that you prioritize God in your life. And you give Him first. David said this uh, in Psalm 119, 119, which, by the way, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. And if you read it, I really encourage you, go home and read it. I, we are not going to read it all chapter today because I think you want to get home for dinner. But if you read each verse in Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, has something, each verse has something to do with the Word of God. So, uh, uh, David is saying this, I rise early 
before the sun is up. Right? I cry out for help and put my hope in your words. For this reason, it's so important to start your day with reading the Bible. As Kelly, you know Kelly, Jesus and coffee. Or coffee and Jesus. The order we can debate on. <laughs> or Coke and Bible. When I say Coke, it's Coca-Cola. Don't go wrong ways, okay? I want to just make a full disclosure here. When you hear me talking about Coke, it's Coca-Cola. Okay, number two practic uh, practic things, practical thing that you can do to uh, help you grow and understand the Bible is study God's Word. And what do you mean study, you might ask? Well, I'm going to tell you in just a minute, but first let me give you a verse to think about. This is God speaking to Joshua in the Old Testament to each uh, and not, to, not just to Joshua, but also to each one of us today. Joshua 1.8 says this. Study this book of instruction continually. So actually it's God speaking to Joshua. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it. What means meditate? Think about it. Let it ponder on it. Let think about it. Even if you have only three minutes, read the Bible verse. And as you are driving to work... Meditate on that Bible verse. Think about that Bible verse. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then you will prosper and succeed in all you do. I never found anyone having problem with wanted to succeed. But we have to take the whole Bible verse to be able to reap the benefits at the end of this verse. And the first part is study, meditate, and obey it. If we do those, then we will be able to experience and prosper in everything that we do. But to be able to do that, we have to do the first part. And how do you study the Word of God? Well, to be honest with you, sometimes I like to even just Google it. Most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, if you just Google a Bible verse or what, if you just say like, what God wants to say in this Bible verse, you get most, most of the time good input, good uh, ideas from there. Um, how to study the Word of God. I want to just give you uh, three points, if you want to call it under this uh, point. First, get a translation that you like. There are many translations out there. And if you don't like it, well, you don't study it. So find a translation that you really like. Many people think that the Bible has been translated over 2,000 years and been diluted. Because many people assume that the translation of the Bible is translation from translation from translation. But that's not true. The, trans, the translation of the Bible, they all go to the original text, which, by the way, still exists today. And they all go to the original text, and they are translating from the original. But it's these are different translations. So they translate from the original manuscript. manuscript. Um, now, let me explain you a little about the translations, because there are three kinds of translation. It's, today's message is more teaching than preaching. The first one, uh, first uh, kind, it's formal equivalency, which actually that means uh, word by word. Even if the sentence is not too easy to understand, they try to literally translate the Bible from the original manuscript, manuscript word by word. So that is a formal equivalency. You have translation like King James Version, uh, New King James Version, also New American Standard Bible, uh, NASB, uh, or ESV, English Standard Bi uh, Version. Uh, those are kind of formal equivalences. Second category of translation are functional equivalency. This one is not word by word and more like thought by thought. So uh, uh, made more sense to fit, especially in different languages, when you have all the words kind of backwards, right? Actually, I don't think... The other languages are backwards. I think English is backwards, but that's just my opinion. Anyhow, so that is make it easy for translation. So it's 
thought by thought translated. And uh, you have a translation like um, New Living Translation, Good News Translation, uh, Today English Version. So those are like NLT, GNT, TEV. Every time you have those letters, is each letter stands for a word. So you have to just really uh, try to understand what those are. The one that I like the most, me personal, and actually combines the two, formal equivalency and functional equivalency, it's the translation NIV, New International Version. Because this translation were over 100 scholars that came together over a period of 10 years study and translated the Word of God. So uh, NIV does both formal and functional equivalents. And actually, this translation being the best sell uh, since 1987. Uh, the last and not the least uh, not the least. type of translation, it's paraphrase. And this is one that a lot of people picked on. Because they are like, this is not the word of God. They are, and they are, they are little nasty about it and talk and just, just don't li listen to nasty people. That's all I'm saying. Um, if, if they are right, if those people are right, the love of God will, rise, will you know, raise up or go out through their hearts. But me personal, I do not consider the paraphrase translations as original Bible or as a Bible because it's a paraphrase. And when paraphrase means they are reading the Bible, the original manuscript, and then they are going to say it how they will say it. Which, by the way, that's what I do every time I preach, right? I'm pulling out a Bible verse or two or three, and I'm telling you what I think with my own words uh, the Bible is saying. So that's what they are saying. But some of those paraphrase uh, uh, Bibles are really good to read. And actually, uh, many times when I study for uh, uh, sermons, for messages, uh, I look at two, three, four different translations. Because you can get better understanding what apostle or God wants to say through the uh, Bible if you see it in different uh, translation. So those are uh, the Living Bible, TLB or MSG, also known as the Message Bible. So those are the paraphrase Bibles. And... To make sense for all of you, let me just give you an example. I picked up one Bible verse that I'm going to read it in three different uh, translations, right? One of those, uh, each from one of those categories. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse, verse 4, King James Version is saying this. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth and not. Charity Vaunteth not, itself is not puffed up. So, again, King James Version. If you like it, go for it. NIV, the same verse, is saying, Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. And the last, it's a message translation saying, Love never gives up, love cares more for others than for itself. Love doesn't want it, doesn't have Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head. You get the point. <laughs> Just different translation. Get a translation that you like, that makes sense. And by the way, you don't have to go to a, a bookstore to read them. You can just, on your phone, on the uh, computer, you can just read different translation, find out which one you like, and then go and order the book. Today's world, you can order on Amazon. will be there overnight. Right? No excuses to not have. Actually, if any of you lack the NIV translation Bible that I love and I like, we do have actually on-site uh, NIV Bibles. If you know people that would like to have a Bible and they don't have a Bible, we do have the NIV translation available for people because we believe it's the Word of God. And by the way, your tithe and offering is buying those Bibles to go to people. So, second point is that get a study Bible. And you might ask, what is a study Bible? Well, the Bible stu uh, the study Bible, it's a Bible that I have actually two versions uh, that I use uh, very often. As you can see, it's much thicker than the regular Bible. And the study Bible has a lot of 
depends by each kind, but most of them has different maps, uh, has a diction, um, yeah, dictionary at the back that you can just find the word that you are looking to, uh, let's say uh, love, and will give you all the, not all of them, but most of the verses that you find in the Bible and so on and on. Uh, something else, they have all kind of commentaries, they have all kind of introduction uh, in front of each letter or each book of the Bible, who wrote it, when was written, why was written, who was the audience, and on and on and on. So those are just uh, very good resources. Some of those uh, has commentaries on the side of the study Bible, some of them has at the bottom. Uh, as you can see, this one has like half is the Word of God and half are the commentaries in the, uh, the Bible. So this one is just the Zanderman uh, NIV study Bible. The other one is called the Jesus Bible. That is the same, it's a study Bible. I brought those here just for you if you want to look at them to make sense what uh, a Bible study is all about. You are welcome to come and look at those. Are not yours to take home, okay? It's part of my uh, office. So <laughs> that being said, third, the last but not the least, get in a small group and study the Word of God together with other people. Because that actually when you get the most. And I still, I'm, and to be honest with you, I hope for the rest of my life I will be part of a small Bible study. Because it's amazing, even for me as a preacher and a teacher, to just see how people are thinking about other Bible verses that I never thought about. So when we sit down around the table or we sit down in the living room and we talk about the Word of God, we're like, oh, I never thought about that verse like you. And it's just bringing the word of God alive in our lives. So actually, I want to challenge you today, right? Today, I want to throw you a challenge that if you want, Wednesday, I am going to start a reading plan. And it's through the Bible app. And then I think we have a QR code. You can scan this QR code. You can start and be part of reading the Bible for 14 days, two weeks, day by day together. So I'm looking for 25 of you, at least, that we are going to read the Word of And if you never did this, it's a very easy, it's uh, the Bible app. We also, you can uh, scan the QR code. Also, we are going to have all the information in the email that you will be part of, if you want to call it my group, uh, we are going to read together, and it's very easy. You read a devotional for probably a minute and a half, two minutes, then you read the Bible verses that refer to that uh, uh, devotion, and then the part that I love, at the end of each day, you guys, you all can comment about it. It's so awesome to just see other people's comments, and we are all filled of life, and we see the Word of God coming uh, come alive when we study together. So, that being said, there is a challenge for your next two weeks. I was thinking, I was talking with Kelly, and I was like, we should do it for a whole year. And I was like, no, nah, I'm going to wait. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose more than half of them. Let's just, let's finish strong. Let's end strong 14 days. That's all I'm asking for you, 14 days reading. And by the way, some things happen sometimes, and you might miss the day. All I'm asking is just, you miss the day, not big deal. Don't miss two. Just, you know, catch up. Even if you cannot catch up, start with the next day. Just skip one day. It's fine. But I want all of us to just experience together how the Word of God comes alive when we study and apply those biblical principles in our lives. So, start your day reading God's Word. Study God's Word. And the last but not the least, stand firm using God's Word. Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verse 13 and 17. Therefore, put the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. If you pay attention, not if the day will come, when the day will come. So we have to read the word of God. We have to prepare because the day will come that we have to stand firm. It's not a question of if, it's about when. And for this reason, it's very uh, important. And when he's saying about put the full armor of God, you don't want the fight to start for you to start getting dressed with the full armor of God. 
You want to be prepared for the fight. You want to just put the armor of God before the fight starts. If you, I'm not sure how, I'm not sure how many of you uh, watch any fights out there uh, on TVs or shows or anything like that. But they are in their locker room getting ready, getting dressed, getting prepared to go in the fight. That's the idea. You have to put the full armor of God before the fight starts. So, using the word of God, it's empowering us to put this armor of God. This is what Jesus actually did. Every time the devil attacked him, if you read the story of Jesus in the Bible, you see that actually Jesus replied to the devil with the Bible verses, with the word of God. So, if you are going to face a war, let's get you some weapons. Let's get the Bible in you. When you read and study the word of God, the Holy Spirit will remind you when you need it. I'm not sure about you, but as I said, I'm not very, I'm, I don't have a very good long-term memory. But it's amazing because I read the Bible and I don't know where the ver verses is. I don't even, sometimes I don't even know what book it is. But I kind of know. And it's amazing that when I struggle with something, the Holy Spirit just reminds me about, oh, do you remember this Bible verse? I'm like, yeah, I remember. I still don't remember where, but then I remember the Bible verse, two, three, four, five words of it. I Google it. I find the whole chapter and the verse, and then I get to read it again. So the Holy Spirit will remind you, but the Holy Spirit will remind you what you read already, what you read already. So to be able, if it's, you never read it, it's nothing to be reminded of. So for this reason, it's important to read the Word of God. When you face darkness in your life, you can't remember what David said, actually. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. So no matter how dark the path is, no matter how dark uh, I'm facing uh, in front of me, I know that he's going to light up the path. And if I go to the word of God, I have no doubt that he is going to make a light on my path. So, start your day reading God's Word, study God's Word, and stand firm using God's Word. And let me close with this. The Bible points you to Jesus. You can read Jesus' words in John chapter 5, verse 39, NLT. I use New Living Translation just to highlight the point. You search the Scriptures, Jesus is saying... Because you think they give you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me. That's what Jesus said. We don't read the Bible to just be saved. We read the Bible to point us to the Jesus that saves us. So, we have to understand that the Bible point, point you to Jesus. The Bible knowledge will not take you to heaven. Don't make it a, uh, don't make it a religious act, reading the Bible. Be intentional and make it relational. If the Bible is alive, if I'm alive, it's going to be a relation between the Word of God, which is God, and me. So we have to be intentional. Also, the Bible shows you how to become like Jesus. Second Timothy chapter 3 says this. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scripture, the word of God, it's equipping us to be ready for every good work. Also, the Bible instructs you to do what Jesus did. What did God do? And many of you might say he loves us, right? Well, that is the motive. That actually is not the verb. Look at the most famous verse in the Bible. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave. That's what he did. The reason is he loved. But what he did, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him. Him shall not perish but have eternal life. It is a blessing to be able to give and help others. It is a reason why Christmas season is most joyful season of the year. 
because most of, when I say most of, are some that still think about themselves, even through the Christmas season. But most of us, around Christmas season, we think about the others. We think about giving, think about blessing others, we think about helping others, it's about the others. And for this reason, it's such a joyful season. Well, let's not do it just around the Christmas season. Let's do it all year round to think and to become more like Jesus. That is to give. So that was John uh, 3.16. Look what First jo uh, John 3.16 is saying. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. It's a blessing to give. And to be honest with you, it's a greater blessing to give than to receive. Because when we give out of our time, out of our gifts and talents, out of our finances, out of who we are, when we give, we bless others. And when we give, we become more like God who is a giver. Many of us pray, Lord, make me more like you but we hold on to everything that we own. Let's become intentional in becoming more like Him who is a giver. I would like to close this series, and I've been thinking about uh, how to close this series, what the Bible is all about. And through the whole four uh, um, messages, I want to just make it in one sentence that I hope you all will remember it. What is the Bible all about? The Bible points you to Jesus so you can become like Jesus and do what Jesus do, what Jesus did. The Bible, the whole Bible from the Genesis all the way to Revelation, it's about pointing us to Jesus. It's about to help us become like Jesus. And if we become like Jesus, we will do more of what Jesus did. And this, if I can have everyone please stand up. I'm not sure where you are in your walk with God. I'm not sure if you gave your life ever to God. But if you never gave your life to Christ, if you never accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, we want to give you that opportunity today. All you have to do is just acknowledge that He is a Son of God. It's about accepting Him as your Lord and Savior. And I'm not sure where you are in your walk with God, but maybe you did it a long time ago. Here in this room or maybe watching online. Maybe you gave your life to God a long time ago and something happened. Somehow you, fall, you uh, found yourself falling astray or uh, going your own ways. Today, you can just reconnect. Today, you can come back. Today, you can just rededicate your life to Christ. Everybody, please close your eyes. If that person is you, here or on watching this message online, all I want you to do is just put your hand on your heart and say this prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. I recognize him as my Lord and Savior. Today, I give up my own ways and choose your way of going through life. Be my Savior, be my Lord. If you said that prayer, that's all it takes for Him to become your Savior, for Him to become your Lord, for Him to become alive in your life, and for Him to take you to a better life. Not necessarily easier, but it's going to be better. Through Him, by Him, and for Him, we can have victorious life. We can experience freedom that we never experienced. So if you said that prayer, and if you need more help in growing in your relation with God, please let us know. We do have a book that we want to uh, get to you. It's called What's Next? That is going to help you in your walk with God.